self-awareness is typically the first step before you can even try to implement a boundary because if you don't really get a greater understanding of who you are or even trying to figure that out because another thing self-awareness is not a one-size-fits-all model um you know that's when you can start saying okay i get upset when this happens so now i need to place a boundary here Welcome to the Living Her Truth podcast, where we have honest conversations about what it means to live a purpose-driven life. I am your host, Lakeisha Woodard from LakeishaWoodard.com, the place where women receive the tools necessary to feel seen, heard, and supported while pursuing their purpose. And now every week, you'll learn those same tools through candid and transparent conversations. Tasha, thank you so much for saying yes to have this conversation with me today. No problem. I'm so excited for the opportunity. Um, I love engaging with people that I've never met before. I'm just a connector. I love having like authentic relationships. So I'm excited. <laughs> me too. I'm, I'm excited. And I also love to have authentic, uh, authentic relationships. I'm also a lover of a good come up story. So <laughs> um, which, is, which is well known for for me, I just I just love to hear stories of, of triumphs, and, and I'm just really excited for you to to share your story with my with my community today. And I just want to thank you for allowing me the opportunity to sit down and have this conversation this conversation with you. Because you don't have to you don't have to do that. So I appreciate you for being here. But um, I like to start off every episode just talking about how I've come to know the person that I'm in a conversation with and so this episode is no different so you guys as you know i am dedicating this month to my supporters my supporters and my listeners of you know the podcast and also of my business this is truth and um, tasha and i are actually in a facebook group together and i just so happens to um answer a, a request in regards to you know, being a, a guest on podcast, I kind of like put my podcast um, website out there and it attracted Tasha's attention and she decided to fill out a guest form and come on and share her story with us on today. So I'm super excited to get into the conversation. So Tasha, I know with you, you are really big on setting healthy boundaries, right? Yeah. So what what put you in a position where you needed to set healthy boundaries? Ooh, listen, I have a whole track sheet. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but um, I will say, ultimately, um, my sexual assault experience actually um, is where I had to reinforce boundaries. But my first introduction of understanding the importance of a boundary was the loss of my father. And so I was 16 um, in high school, um, you know, at the age I'm trying to figure out who I am and those kind of things. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. from a small community um, on the Eastern Shore, um, my dad had actually passed away from a work related incident. And so it was one of those, it was crazy. Like it was in the news front page of the paper. Oh yeah, um, it was sudden and it was to the point that, you know, because the community was so small, like everyone knew who my father was. So they automatically knew who I was based upon the death. And so with that, I had, you know, news anchors coming to the house, showing up, trying to get, you know, insight from my mom, who's totally grieving and not really understanding what's happening in the moment, trying to get statements from her. Um, I've had, you know, the police had to show up to our house to give us the news, you know, about my dad, helicopters. So that already put me under a microscope that I wasn't necessarily comfortable with. And so 
knowing that, you know, typically we had this normal so-called life where we were accustomed to doing day-to-day -day things without disruption. And now you have people flocking to you trying to understand how do you feel about this? Um, how are you handling this? Um, what happens next? And so having people come in and feel entitled to be in the know of what's going on in our household is where I was supposed to first introduced to the word boundary. <laughs> oh my goodness. Oh, I'm first off, I'm sorry to hear about your father. Thank Losing you. a parent is a traumatic experience enough, but then the whole situation around you finding out like that's even a a traumatic experience with the, yeah. the police showing up the helicopters swirling like you didn't even get the chance to you and your mom didn't even get a chance to like understand what the police officer is saying exactly exactly <laughs> and my poor brother was at work he was working for um cell one which is now i guess at&t i don't know they changed their name yeah at the time um, he was 21 and someone went to the store and said to him, oh, I'm sorry to hear about your father. He had no idea what was going on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> and, this, and I'm assuming this is before Facebook because you yes. know, <laughs> no, no shade, no shade, no shade to, to, to Facebook and how we, and how we use Facebook, but it just irks me mm -hmm. to find out about the death of a loved one. On yeah. Facebook, because I feel like if you have my number in your phone, you can call me. I, I shouldn't. I, I I shouldn't be finding out with no your, your Facebook community. Like, why would you? Like, why would you do that? Why would you just walk up to the store like that? Why he's at work? Obviously, he doesn't know because he's at work. Exactly. Obviously, he doesn't know. Yeah. You know. Oh, oh my goodness. That that that's even that's even a traumatic experience right there because. Yeah. I could just imagine your brother looking at this person like, what are you talking about? Exactly. And it's just crazy because he's named after our dad and he looks exactly like him. So that's just <laughs> a whole bunch of triggers, you know? And so in that, it was one of those where people are watching you um, step by step. Um, it was kind of like, well, when is she returning to school? How is she going to behave when she returns to school? It was just different things like that that our life now became a stage for everybody else. And so I'm a very private person anyway. And so mm -hmm. experiencing that was a hard transition that I wasn't prepared for at all. Oh my goodness. And so that happened when you were 16? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what was the time frame between that traumatic experience and the traumatic experience of your sexual assault? I was 18. Sexual oh assault. my goodness. So had you even like <laughs> no address the even the trauma from your dad yet? No. And and that's I was just like one thing on top of another because I it was my freshman year um in college and that already was enough within itself because um the school that I ended up going to, University of Maryland Eastern Shore, was not even my first choice. Um, at first, you know, <laughs> just to be honest, I wanted to get far away from home as possible. But once my dad passed away, it was kind of like, do I really want to be far away from my mom and my brother? Am I going to be okay being far away from them? And so uh, University of Maryland Eastern Shore gave me that balance where I was far enough to gain freedom, but yet close enough to be near them if something were to happen or if I had a moment where I just needed to be around them because during that time, I was really having abandonment issues um, and knowing that you know my father had passed. And so it was kind of like, in my mind, I would replay every conversation I had with my mom or my brother. Is this going to be our last conversation? What's going to happen? Because I didn't receive the closure that I wanted with my dad because the last time I saw him was the night before. He would leave but way before I would get up to go to school and he didn't return home that day. So, yeah. Wow. That's a, uh, wow. That's, that's, that's the one so many different levels because the your college not being your first choice right mm -hmm. please tell me that you didn't like blame yourself for the assault like in your head say if i never would have came here type of thing 
that definitely was a question um, in my mind. Um, I blame myself completely uh, for the- Hey family, I just wanna take a second to tell you how I can help you build a strategy to create the life that you journal about so every day is a vacay. Because like you, I had grand plans at the top of the year and then COVID hit. So my plans had to pivot, not pause. And guess what? It's the same for you. In my Master Life class, Strategize Your Vision, I teach you how to get back on track so you can end 2020 with purpose. Now, only you can determine if you're ready to do the work. And if you're ready, then I'm ready. And guess what? Class is open right now. All you have to do is visit strategizeyourvision.com to enroll today. Now, back to the conversation. Assault. Um, I thought that it was something that I did, being too trusting, being too likable, being too easygoing, that I could have waved some, you know, misconstrued flags for this person to say, you know what, here's an easy target, here's an easy bait for me to get what I want. Um, even saying, maybe I made the wrong decision in choosing this school. Maybe I should have just, you know, stayed home and not go to college until I felt like I was ready. Um, that played a lot in my mind, like, would this have happened if I went to my first choice? Or would this have happened if I just stayed home and said, you know what, I'm just going to wait and take a break from high school um, before entering college and just go from there. So a lot of those scenarios played so far in my mind that it took several years for me to even go back to my college for homecoming. Oh, wow. You know, I can, I can relate on so many different levels to what you just said, um, because it's, it's no safe secret. I'm very transparent about the fact that I was sexually abused by my mother's husband for eight years. The abuse started when I was eight years old and it ended when I was 16. And for a long time, I blamed myself for not doing more to um, not doing more to stop the abuse. Um, while in college, I joined a nonprofit where I went to different like schools and organizations and churches, things like that, to talk to children um, about different at-risk behaviors. It was a bunch of us college students doing so. And so I obviously talked about sexual abuse, and I never forget doing one of my speaking engagements afterwards. Um, somebody asked me, like, why you didn't like fight back mm -hmm. my abuser and for the first time like nobody had really like asked me that like in that in that way before but for the first time I had to like really break it down and I'm like first off <laughs> it started when I was eight years old right. like don't picture me as I am right now picture right. me as an eight-year-old fragile child I was oh my like God. my mother's husband was six feet over 200 pounds yeah. What am, what am I going to do? So I felt myself having to like defend myself, mm -hmm. you know, and, and that was the first, because it's, it's one thing to defend yourself within the family, because I had to do that. Yeah. It's, it's another thing to defend yourself on the stand, because I did confront my abuser in the court of law, and mm -hmm. he served time for it, but it's a whole different thing to defend yourself in front of a stranger, and 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 you guys, this was a speaking gig where I was talking in front of parents, because we also talk to parents too, to let them know what their child is experiencing. Yeah. Like, experiencing, you know, and so just like, you know, dealing with that, and, and luckily that particular question didn't tear me up the way that it could have if I wasn't in therapy, you know, because I was, you know, fortunate enough to, to get to, to, to go to, to go to therapy, you know, but man, I, I yeah, so it's common for yeah. us to blame ourselves. It's, yeah. It's, it's common. It's common to do that. But, um, how, when did you go, did you go through therapy? Let me just ask that. Did you go through therapy? Yeah. Um, right away. No. Um, I was very hesitant. Well, one, um, and I think this is why I'm so big on advocacy, especially for college campuses, the importance of therapy and knowing your resources that you have that yeah. are free for you to use because 
there was no type of promotion like that for like the career center, the counseling center, different things like that. It was just more of a, you know, if you need tutoring, here you go. Like they heighten that up. But for other things that could impact our academic progression, they didn't really talk about, they didn't really address then. I will say now, they've gotten so much better um, promoting awareness there. And I think because more people are speaking up and it's becoming more prevalent. Um, and so not really knowing how to identify signs or what's going on or even how to be an ally, I think that's why you know counseling just wasn't something that was mentioned quite frequently there. So I didn't know where to go. I didn't know who to talk to. So I just did what was familiar with what, which was shut myself out and shut myself down and not say anything. Um, it wasn't until my best friend, who was my roommate at the time, noticed changes in my behavior. She noticed that I was really withdrawn. She noticed that I wasn't as um, social or as joyful as yeah. I've always been. And she's like, something is going on. Um, I would shrink back from mirrors. I didn't like how, what I saw because it was the guilt and the shame that I carried. And she was like, I'm your best friend. I know that something is going on and I need you to talk to me. And so in that moment, I lost it. And I was just like, look, this is what happened. Okay. And I was just like, I just didn't know how to start. I didn't know what to say. Um, I thought it was my fault because this was somebody that I had considered to be an acquaintance. I mean, I don't know. And then she was like, well, first thing, everything that you think about yourself in a negative way, we're going to cancel that because that's not who you are. And she said, you need to talk to somebody professionally. And she said, if you want me to go with you to the counseling center, I will. And so that's how that started. So, I mean, she is still my best friend till this day. Right. And I was just like, wow. Um, because the way our dynamic works, um, usually I'm the one that's really optimistic and I speak life into her about a lot of things. And so for those roles to reverse in that moment, I was like, wow. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, 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 man. It's and and it's so crazy that you that you say that for the roles to be to be reversed because when we are the pillar of strength, mm -hmm. asking for help is not something that naturally comes to us. Because I know I was like that for for a long time. Um, you know, I I would just keep up this this facade that everything was was okay. Because even yeah. though the abuse had ended for me and I was out of that situation, I still hadn't dealt with the trauma. And so, yeah, so going, so going to trial at 16. So by the time I was in, uh, so I was like junior. So by the time I was a senior in high school, he, he goes to jail. And then I, right after high school, I go into, I go into college. Nobody said, let's get this girl some, some therapy. Nobody sat down and talked to me about what was going on. I literally tried to just pick up and just go on with my life. And I ran into a brick wall, like immediately. But thankfully God put somebody, you know, you know, who get, gave me somebody that was willing to pay for the therapy sessions and and she did and at 18 years old you know i friend if she wouldn't have asked and offer i probably would have never had therapy and i was 18 right. and she offered so i was just like okay like i didn't even take it seriously in the beginning I'm just right. like, wait if you're gonna if you're gonna pay for it that type of thing you know but Thankfully, thank God, I, you know, I, I had enough in me to yeah. start to take the the sessions seriously because right. it really helped me. It really helped me to heal. Now, with you and your situation, you said that you was afraid to mm -hmm. go to to go to counseling because you thought that people will will blame you. Why did you? I mean, why did you feel that way? A lot of it started, I would say from the unresolved issues that I still had with the trauma from the loss of my dad. Um, mm -hmm. because I didn't properly assess or recover from that. And so um, when my dad passed away, I was automatically assimilated into a grief group in high school. And the way that happened, my name is being called on the, um, the intercom and i'm like did i get in trouble you know like they start calling a list of students right and i'm like well what is this for and so then element of surprise i'm in a, a grief group they're like yeah this is a group <laughs> for um you all who have who have experienced you know sudden loss whether it was a parent or a sibling or a grandparent and i'm like that's weird you know um because you didn't necessarily ask me how i would feel about it and so 
that right there, that experience kind of paralyzed me to say, is this something I even want to do for anything else? Because I understand the intent behind what they did, right? I get it. I understand that their heart may have been in the right place or they thought it was a good idea. But a lot of times when you make decisions, you leave out the most important component, which is the person that it's directly impacting. And so I'm sitting here and then they're wondering why I'm not being open, why I'm not talking, why I'm just kind of sitting there to myself on the sideline. And then, you know, the idea was, okay, here's a journal. Why don't you start writing out? you know, how you feel kind of thing. And I'm like, to some extent, yes, journaling was helpful, but what do I do with that once it's written, you know? And so that kind of reminded me like, uh, is this going to be another one of those scenarios where one, they're going to try to get me to conform to how everyone else should respond to this session or how, you know, every other person has responded to their traumatic experience. And so those thoughts came to my mind um, where it was almost kind of like, are they going to shift blame to me or is this going to be someone who's understanding and really listening? And so I thought about how I had a not so good experience with, you know, a therapist in that regard. And I'm like, is this going to be the same song? Just a different experience type of thing. Oh my God. Great intent, but just wrong delivery. Yeah. So, you know, so whoever is listening to this, like, I, I, I really hope that you pay attention to that because I, I think in those situations, even really right now today, honestly, the, the feelings of the victim kind of gets overshadowed a little bit, especially when it comes to, uh, to sexual assault. And, 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 and this, I could be biased, you know, based off of, based off of my experience, you know, I could be biased, but it just seems like, you know, our, our feelings are just not necessarily taken into, taken into consideration. Yeah. And even right now today, I hate to say it, you know, women are still being blamed. It's always, well, what did she do? What was she wearing? What caused mm -hmm. her, what caused him? As if, <laughs> you, you know, like, like just automatically giving the man an, an, an excuse. Girl, don't let, don't, don't let me get on my, right, on my, my so, no. yeah. <laughs> right, right. It's like, don't let me get on my soapbox, but really just take into consideration the person's feelings before you do, before you, you know, before you, before you act. And, you know, sometimes people just don't know what to say or what to do. Yeah. And in those situations, it's okay to ask. Right. I mean, I help you. <laughs> right. Like don't assume, right? You know, and, and I think that that's the that's what really helped me, I wanna say, for me to be a little more open when my best friend actually sat down and asked me. Like she didn't try to give me a textbook answer or didn't try to say what she thought I wanted to hear in that moment, but for the first time I felt seen. It was kind of like, okay something is going on. I don't know necessarily what, but instead of me trying to put all these hypothetical situations in my mind, I'm just going to ask her. Yeah. I love that you said that you're, that you felt seen because what I do, I do it. So my clients can feel seen, heard, and supported. Like those are my three values, my three takeaways that I want every client or every podcast listener to walk away feeling seen, heard, and supported because I felt heard, yeah. like really heard the first time in therapy because that first therapy session, like you said, I didn't really take it serious. It was just like, uh, you know, but he, he asked me like why I was there or whatever. I'm telling him the story. just kind of like, mm, you know, just telling the story or whatever. And he stops me and say, hold on, hold on, wait a minute. You do realize that th what happened to you is not your fault. Yes. And I was like, really? Like, seriously, like, really? Because nobody has sat down and had this conversation with me. Right. You guys, after, you know, when, when I was going through the, the trial process, and, you know, I don't talk about this, but when the trial process, all fingers was pointing at me. Like, people were mad that their brother, their uncle, their daddy, whomever, was on trial. Right. And who, and who caused that? Me. I caused that. So nobody sat down to say, Keisha, this wasn't your fault. Right. He told me, he was like, people failed you. Yes. Mm -hmm. And when he said that, my guard came down. And I yeah. was like, okay, mm -hmm. I think I may be able to trust this guy. 
Exactly. It's like a weight was lifted off my shoulder. Yeah, absolutely. And it's just so important because when people are actively listening to not just what you're saying, but also what you're not saying, it helps them grab a bigger glimpse of the picture. And, th and that's what people fail to understand. Any type of trauma you experience, automatically you have a guard when there's somebody new trying to invade your space because they crossed a boundary or they crossed an important line that you had created in the sand. And so you have to allow me to open up and give you permission per se to be like, you know what, I trust you enough to, you know, or I see based upon the consistency that you provide, you're okay. And, or even their interactions with other people, because people say a lot. Um, <laughs> and, you know, um, especially when they encounter someone who has dealt with sexual abuse or sexual assault. Um, I've had my fair share of guys in relationships who are like, yeah, I'll support you or I understand, but then after a while, this is too much baggage. I can't really deal with this. And so you have to really know what you are capable of being able to manage or handle or even have the capacity to withstand. So everyone has a story just because my trauma may not look like your trauma. Don't discredit my feelings because of a trauma that happened years prior because as a person, the healing process is continuous. It doesn't just stop because that date expired of when it happened. So, you know, Tasha, this is, this is a, a great way to uh, transition into boundaries, right? So we can make sure that we have the right people around us to support us when we're going through our, our healing process. Now, you are very specific with saying healthy boundaries. We need to set healthy boundaries. Okay, like intuitively we supposed to know what healthy means but what do you mean when you say <laughs> healthy boundaries the healthy part oh boy um i want to say because i've tolerated too many unhealthy ones that i finally i wouldn't say got it right but i had a greater understanding of the opposite of unhealthy <laughs> So it's almost kind of like when you think about when you're a kid and your parents are like, don't touch the stove when it's on because it's hot. And you're like, okay. And then you watch, you know, what it looks like when the stove is turned on, how you know the difference, right? But then you, it's just still something about it that gravitates you to say, you know what, I'm just going to try it anyway. And then touch it and then you get burnt and then you get upset and you don't like how it feels. And so I've experienced a lot of unhealthy um, boundaries with, you know, allowing people in my space that shouldn't have been there or people who were more so seasonal. But then I said, no, because I'm a giver innately. So I just kind of want to be like, no, you can come too. You can come for the ride. And no, have no good intentions. Um, a lot of red flags that, you know, you just kind of dismiss a little bit. And so um, when I recognize healthy boundaries, it's like, what is their reaction or response when I say, no. Does their behavior cause a trigger for me of something that I was once accustomed to? And so that's a key indicator for me if this is a healthy connection or not. Um, because again, being a giver, a lot of times you are a giver of time, you're a giver of money, you're a giver of being a resource, you're a giver of being a, su a support for somebody else, but when it's not reciprocated, it's like, hold on. This is not a mutual exchange here, um, the whole checks and balances type thing. And so no. even if they don't verbally say something that is toxic or, you know, blatantly behave in a way that you can identify quickly, that is an unhealthy boundary, but the subtle, the subtleness, a lot of times you can see like, okay, this person is only reaching out to me because they're in a jam once again. And that's the only time they recognize the value of what our relationship dynamic is and so if you have a person who says yeah we're friends but the only time you hear from them is when they need oh girl 
you know, I got caught up in this and I was just wondering if you had a couple dollars to help me out with or girl, I didn't have time to, you know, make an appointment with my therapist, but I know that this is the practice that you do. So could you be my therapist in this moment? Like things like that, right? And so it's like, do you really invest into the connection or is it more so the need that you have of me? And so when I see certain things like that, I'm like, okay, does saying yes to them mean saying no to me? And so I don't like how I feel when I compromise or discredit my feelings for the sake of someone else because I did that from the sexual abuse <laughs> by not saying anything about it in the beginning. And so I know how I felt there. And I'm like, I'm not going through that hamster wheel again. I refuse. And so my thing is, when I look at connections and healthy boundaries, you're my friend when I hold you accountable and when you hold me accountable. And if you don't like the accountability, then I need to question who you are in my life. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And, and shouldn't have to feel bad about the fact that you cut somebody off. Because too many times we feel bad about that. Because just because we befriended somebody and may have been friends, we could be friends for like 20 minutes and we can see that, okay, this is probably not going to be a beneficial relationship. So I need to go ahead and cut this off. We won't even cut it off because we feel bad within 20 minutes that we that we cut off the relationship. We have to pay attention to the triggers. And I'm so glad that you brought that up because we have to pay attention to the triggers because the triggers is going to let us know you know, not only whether or not we need to set boundaries with this person, but the triggers is also going to let you know oh, right. what other areas of healing you need to address. Exactly. Yes. Yes. Because, yeah. again, you know, people just think, oh, I went to therapy for like five sessions. I'm great. No. <laughs> it's a continual work and one of my really really close friends um she has an inner work board and basically that's talking about the different areas that you notice depending on where you are um personally or professionally that are still triggers for you and why are they still triggers and get into the root of those things and so she'll mark those areas up on her wall, like on post-it notes and say, okay, these are the areas that I'm still finding challenges in. Why is it easier for me to address certain areas instead of the others that I'm still having challenges with? And then really get to the bottom of that. It, but it takes vulnerability and you got to be vulnerable. You have to, because if you're not, you're going to continue to put a bandaid on things and think you're okay. Yes. Vulnerability and also self-awareness. And yeah. it takes the, the strength and the confidence to uh, acknowledge what it is that you're feeling. And it, you know, it, it takes the, the, the strength to, and the courage to address it. Because if you don't address it, it's going to always be there. And I said, it, I said it once and I'll say it again. Unresolved trauma does affect every decision that you make, regardless yeah. of how successful you are in your life. Yes. Yes, yes, and yes. Regardless of how successful you are in your life, unresolved trauma is affecting your decisions, how you show up in the world, how you view yourself, how you talk to other people, how you talk to yourself, what you think about people, what you think about yourself. Like, it will affect it. So it's something that we absolutely need to get healing for no matter how ugly the trauma is yeah. you know no matter how ugly trauma is and and you and you got two sisters over here who are saying that you need to seek help for it no matter how ugly the trauma is and we have gone through some ugly traumas okay <laughs> and not to say that one trauma is worse than the other because all trauma is equal in you know in in, in my in, you know my opinion absolutely but, you know if, if if we can go through it and say that this is needed, then please heed the word. Please heed the word and know that and know that it's that it's needed. So how do we how do we set healthy boundaries based off of trauma? How how do we how do we do that? Do you think healing has to happen first before we start setting those boundaries? Well I think honestly um from my personal experience um for the healthy boundaries one thing I noticed is that I always downplayed how I felt. So I think acknowledging your feelings is the first step 
to know that a boundary has to be put in place. Um, when you often say, you know, oh, that's just the way they are, or, you know, that's just how it goes. Or sometimes with the unresolved trauma, you say, well, maybe I deserved that reaction, right? So you just try to start thinking of justification or excuses. So once you start doing those things, you realize, okay, wait a minute, what's really going on? Why do you feel like your feelings or emotions aren't valid? And so that's when you have to realize, okay, maybe you're not being clear with what you need from people and you're not being clear on the type of support that's effective for you. And so once you really start understanding and acknowledging if something comes up and you realize it made you uncomfortable or it made you feel upset, acknowledge that, own that. And that's where that self-awareness comes in. And I think self-awareness is typically the first step before you can even try to implement a boundary. Because if you don't really get a greater understanding of who you are, or even trying to figure that out, because another thing, self-awareness is not a one-size-fits-all model, um, you know, that's when you can start saying, okay. I get upset when this happens. So now I need to place a boundary here. And then you have to really get into what does that boundary specifically look like? Does that mean between this time of the day and this time of the day, I need to have some me time to decompress. And so if you are saying that, because you got to verbalize it, you can't expect people to know what's happening or assuming if you're not saying it. And if you're verbalizing and you're noticing that some people are still dismissing your boundary or still being disrespectful, you can say, you know what, I feel like this when you are dismissing the boundary that I have already presented. And because of this, since you're not understanding my boundary, I now have to place you on do not disturb to make sure that my boundaries are respected. Because a lot of times people impersonalize that boundary. Um, they like to place guilt on you because you, you know, put up a boundary. I've gotten a lot of those. And it's to the point that I don't even take it personal. <laughs> I'm just like, you know what? Thank you for showing me who you are and how you feel truly about me. Because if you don't respect my boundary, then you ultimately don't respect me. And so I sleep well at night and knowing that I stood up for myself <laughs> and, you know, I put it out there, but I think you just, one, have to become more self-aware of who you are and know that it's okay that you may feel differently than your friend on a certain matter, it's okay. Because I tell everyone, if we were all the same, the world would be completely boring. <laughs> 100% boring and, and stagnant. We probably wouldn't even get anywhere if we, if we, yeah. if we, all, were, if we all were the same. You know, the, the key thing that you, that you said when it starts is the fact that we have to acknowledge that our feelings are valid for ourselves. You guys, this is so important because until you acknowledge that your feelings are valid, until you do that, you're going to always be in victim mode. And not just victim mode as it relates to a sexual assault. You can go from being, you know, a victim to sexual assault, to a victim of domestic violence, to a victim of workplace bullying, to a victim, to a victim, to a victim, to a victim, because you are not acknowledging that your feelings are valid. Because people are going to treat you the way that you allow them to treat you. And for, and for some abusers out there, like, they look for that. Mm -hmm. They look for the person who doesn't value themselves. They yeah. look, they look for that in you, and 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 they they you know they go after that particular person. Not to say that that's an excuse because they shouldn't they shouldn't do that, and not to say that you have to be some type of way in order to prevent it, you know. But what we want to say is is that your feelings are valid. Yeah. So if you are feeling a certain way, that's okay. it's okay for you to say, Ooh, got this boundary up. You know what? I can't I, I can't even mess with you no more. Or, you know, my feelings are, are are valid. This person made me feel this way, and it's okay for me to address it. Like yeah. all of that. Yeah. All of that is is okay. You know, and I love the fact also, too, that you said that self-awareness is not a one size fit all model. And you're absolutely right. You know, because my the, the foundation of my coaching is pretty much the same. But how I do things with each client is different. Exactly. Because they all have gone through something 
different. But because we have common life experiences, we're able to relate and we're able to, I'm able to build that, that connection with them. So if I do one exercise with, with Atasha, I'm going to do a probably, you know, doing a, a completely different exercise with Lakeisha because right. there are, there are different people, but you know, Tasha and Lakeisha can come together, you know, and, and be sisters and relate to each other because we have common life experiences. Right. And that mm-hmm. is so important. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And you know what? I There was a quote that you put on your guest form that you said, grief and loss, self-recognition and self-discovery inspired me to understand the importance of the grieving process and recognize that it is an individualized experience. Why was it important for you to recognize that the tra- that your trauma mm-hmm. was an individualized experience? Well, for one, I got tired of people telling me shoulda, coulda, woulda, and, you know, trying to basically say how I should have reacted or what I should have said. I just got tired of people trying to create an image of who they think I should be, because on one end, if you're saying this is how you should be, or this is how I believe you would be better, then you're kind of telling me I'm not good enough, (laughs) and so I'm a little bit on a low low, on a low low, yeah, you know, they're like that sweet shade, you know. <laughs> it's kind of like, um, well, I think that you should have did it, th- you know, instead of, or you know how some people are like, mm, you better than me because I would have, in essence, you're calling me dumb. And so um, for me, it's like, okay, um, just like any other thing, like we all have our top tiers and layers of um, love languages, right? So my top one could be quality time, but your top one could be um, words of affirmation. It doesn't mean that one is less important than the other. It just gives us a greater understanding how each one of us should be approached when something comes up, just like with the whole grief process, individual. Like I shouldn't have felt outcasted because for me, it was harder for me to be more vocal because one, you didn't get the context of how I experienced the grief in the first place, you know? And I'm just like, you're assuming because your book says that one, that she should be here as part part of the grieving process, or there should be a window of time where she should no longer be grieving. And I'm like, by whose standards, whose rules? And that's why I want people to understand that it's individual. You have to know what works best for you, because if not, you're causing self-induced stress and pressure that really shouldn't have existed from the beginning. I love that. And, and to, and to add to that, because you may, you know, you made me remember too, also that just because somebody has a cheap X, Y, and Z doesn't mean that they are, that they should be healed by now. Exactly. <laughs> oh, you're not, oh, you're not over that yet? Girl, you didn't done this and this and this. So right. like, like when I, I, I'm sorry, was there a time limit or when I need to overcome or, or heal from something you know it, it irks me when you know somebody says something like that oh like you you still upset over that right <laughs> ma'am mm-hmm. yeah, what yes like we we have to be sensitive to how people grieve like tasha just said we have to be we have to be sensitive to that it's it's one thing let me back it up how do, I, how do I say this without being biased? You guys, it's hard mm-hmm. to tell somebody that you've been violated. Mm-hmm. It is not easy to tell somebody that, that you've been violated. And I don't want to sit here and say, you, don't, you wouldn't understand unless you've been violated. Because my thing is, if you have experienced any type of trauma, you should be able to understand how hard it is to just speak the words, no yeah. matter what your trauma is. But just because my trauma doesn't look like yours, doesn't mean that I should get over it like that in an instant. Exactly. We shouldn't assume that for people, mm-hmm. you know? I, I, I pray it doesn't take you 30 years to heal. I pray that it doesn't. 
but if it does so be it i'm not gonna i'm not gonna rush you i'm not gonna rush you through that that's what i i'm just gonna choose that's what i'm gonna choose not to do because the, the the worst thing you can do is make somebody feel less than yeah or or even lesser than if lesser is even the right grammatical phrase because we already feel low low <laughs> We already, we're already low. We are already low. How, okay, so for you, did you ever like turn in or, or see justice against your attack? Well, here's the crazy part. Um, he disappeared. Um, so, <laughs> <laughs> right. And so for me, a little caveat to all of this. So after the assault, I was then being stalked, um, and so, like, he would randomly pop up in places just trying to make sure I'm not going to tell anybody, and his little friends, little minions around, you know, um, just trying to keep an eye on me, which also I notice now with everything that I do, if I'm somewhere unfamiliar, I'm very hypersensitive, I'm kind of looking to make sure, okay, my keys are out, you know, things are in position, like, if I'm going to the car, groceries, anything like that, um, and it's just, like, in hindsight, I'm grateful that I'm now more hyper aware because prior to the assault, I just kind of was going wherever the wind blow, not paying attention, not really thinking about, you know, safety and all of that as a top priority. Now I'm just kind of like, okay, make sure you let somebody know where you are, you know, you got there safely, whatever, make sure you got in safely, those kind of things, things that we kind of don't really think that are important, they are. And so after the um, sexual assault, um, after that first year, he disappeared. I have no idea um, where he is, um, but I did find out that I wasn't the only one on the list um, at the time. So it was just a lot going on. Um, definitely could tell that this was something that he was accustomed to doing. Um, his father was in law enforcement, so, you know, He's not used to being held accountable. Um, there's that, you know, and so it's just kind of like, mm, got it. So after you realize, okay, maybe people are coming on to you, then you disappear. Mm -hmm. I haven't seen them since. <sighs> Does that bother you? The fact that there's no resolution? Um, it okay. used to. It, it really used to bother me a lot. And I didn't realize how much it bothered me until I used certain things and relationships that I was in as a measurement tool. And I say that because um, I've been in a relationship and I'm like, oh, great. I surpassed year one. I'm good. You know, even if the relationship is in shambles, I'm like, great. Somebody who actually just wants to be with me because I feel like I completed like a level, almost like a video game, right? Crazy. And I'm like, okay, because of that, being unresolved right so i'm just kind of like okay that kind of gives me closure and then I, like i said it goes back to the fact that i didn't ultimately have closure with having a final conversation with my dad before he passed not realizing that once i'm dealing with that and then on top of that the added layer of the assault i'm like here we go again right because he disappeared but then after a while i was just like i can't keep living in fear or thinking of you know, what would I really say if I were to see him face to face now, right? Like, what would I really do? And so after a while, I just had to let it go. And it was really understanding forgiveness wasn't necessarily for him, but it was really for me because me not even one forgiving myself, forgiving what happened or forgiving what he did. I was now allowing the people that I allowed in my space to project those feelings on them, which wasn't fair, because I would place unrealistic expectations like, okay, so you're going to walk away from me too, or you're going to do this or behave that way too, because I didn't address that. Wow. You know, it, it, it doesn't fall, you know, fall short of me that I know that I am one of the lucky ones who was able to bring justice, whether mm -hmm. abuse actually went to to jail for that i know that i am i am blessed in that way so i had the opportunity to have that to have that closure but forgiveness 
also me learning through therapy too that forgiveness wasn't for him it was for me it helped me um in in that way to to get closure and then also you know to forgive my mom helped yeah. me to to get to get closure as well because in such a big way you know mm -hmm. because i'm 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 transparent um and i shared before that my mom knew about the abuse and did nothing to help that's yeah. not that's not a secret and the fact that i didn't have a mom in that you know in that regard you know or just have a a, a mother daughter relationship with my mom growing up really at all mm -hmm. not having that could have left a, a open womb on me as well yeah. so i had to learn how to forgive my mom in order for me to move forward yeah. and understanding that forgiveness had nothing to do with her yeah. but everything to do with with me you know i was able to forgive her and really just you know accept the fact that the having a mother-daughter relationship with my mom between the ages of birth <laughs> and 16 it just wasn't going to happen and it was okay for me to grieve yeah. that loss and it was okay for me to grieve that abandonment right yeah. and understand that i was valid mm -hmm. feeling that way mm -hmm. right and it was okay for me to um move forward with my life and it was okay for me to build a new relationship with my mom yeah it was okay for me to do that if that's what I had chose to do. I chose to do that and it was okay for me to do that. And, you know, I'm so thankful that, that I did because it took my mom to all the way up to, um, so at this point, this probably happened maybe four years ago mm -hmm. for her to finally apologize wow. for not protecting me like she should have. Mm -hmm. Could you imagine? Had I held on to that? Right. For all these years. Right. It's just like, is it worth it to hold on to, right? Uh-uh. Exactly. It's not. It's not. But again, in order to realize that it was acknowledgement of the feelings, it starts with self-awareness and it starts with acknowledging your feelings and validating knowing that your feelings matter. Yeah. So, so you can have that closure in one way or another for mm -hmm. you in yeah. the best way that you can have it you know mm -hmm. you guys is it's hard we get that we yeah. get that and we're and we're not gonna sit here and we haven't sat here and told you that it was easy we just sat here and and told you and, and tried to convince you that it's worth it absolutely absolutely and i think it just really understanding that you are personally worth the investment you got it you got to realize that 100%. And I always um, say this to, to my, my core group of friends that what happened to you, that trauma, that loss, whatever, is an identifier because it's a part of your experience, but it's not your identity. Like it doesn't negate who you are and who, what your purpose is intended to be. It doesn't. It's just a part of your journey that you may need to share with someone else who may be currently experiencing something that you have processed or currently processing. Because a lot of times we try to hide the parts of our lives that aren't so glamorous because we want to paint a picture to people publicly. But we have to be honest with ourselves. We have to. Absolutely. And, and for, for those of you who, are, who may battle with the fact that um, Tasha said that what happened to you is that I didn't have fire. You guys, I can 100% relate to that because for a long time, um, I rebelled against my purpose. Like I've always known what my purpose was. Like I, like I was fortunate enough to, to feel the call, if you will, or, or God speak to me to let me know that my purpose and tell me sharing my story. But for years I went, I ran from it because I'm like, I don't want to be identified. Yes. <laughs> As the woman who, you know, who, who survived sexual abuse. Like, who wants to talk about that? <laughs> you know, like who like for years I I ran from it, but I had to 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 realize that it, it wasn't my identity. 
mm-hmm. and that it was okay for me to walk in, walk in my purpose because there's a way for me to walk in my purpose, share my story, and coach other women without sexual abuse being my identity. Yes, yes. You know, people, when people see me, yes, they know about the sexual abuse, but that's not all they see, though. That's not that everything is. that people talk about. They talk about the fact that I'm really transparent with my conversations, I'm easy to talk to, how I'm so honest, how I'm so confident and I'm so strong, you know, Mm -hmm. that's what they see because this is because I have come to grips and understand that, you know, it's not my identity. So I don't walk as if it is. Right. Exactly. And that's the thing. That is the thing. You have to acknowledge that for you to walk into it. Once you know, you own it. And, you know, it's so funny because um, a lot of people will ask me, well, how do you feel comfortable, you know, sharing this? And, and I reiterate the same thing you said. It's not my identity. Yes, this is something that I had to experience. Yes, this is something that I had to deal with and address, but it's not who I am. This is just a part of what you know about my journey that's it. And they're like, oh, okay, because they just kind of look at, you know, how people, they kind of categorize the things that you tell them, and then they just assimilate you with that category. And I'm like, but what is the full picture of Tasha? What is the full, the fullness of what you see, right? Not just that. And so a lot of times I'm like, if I didn't tell you that, would you had even known that was a part of my story at all? And they're like, no exactly my point you know and so (laughs) it it goes back to really recognizing that the things you go through are identifiers and not your identity and then if you are a believer and you have a relationship with god everything that you go through and deal with does not take away from the fact that you are his you are loved and you are chosen period you are his you are loved and you are chosen. Hear that. If you hear nothing else, hear that. Tasha, has anybody told you you are amazing today? <laughs> You're the first. <laughs> you, you are. You are amazing. You are <laughs> amazing. But before before we we end this conversation, I just want to know. Give us. A, a, a book recommendation or audible recommendation because I'm addicted to audible of a okay. book that you have read or listened to that has impacted your life in some way <laughs> okay so um one book I will say is um by Jonathan McReynolds uh make room and uh one thing about me is that a lot of everything that I have encountered was a testament of my faith. And so with that book, it really talks about how we can get caught up in doing things, get caught up in how we present ourselves that we don't allow God to make room in our lives. And so we get so caught up in what we're doing that we automatically just kind of assume it's what we should be doing, but yet we're not allowing God to really navigate. Oh, I'm gonna have to, I'm definitely gonna have to, I'm definitely gonna have to check out that book because you know my journey started off with me <clears throat> wanting to be Perry Mason. You know, I went to law school and things like that. So the goal of becoming an attorney was the goal that I set when I was probably like eight years old. And um and, and I chased that goal relit, you know, relentlessly, but it wasn't until I got into law school and I was sitting in class and I'm like, oh my God, why am I here? And the desire to be an attorney dwindled. And so that was my point where I had to say, Okay, God, so what's next? I'm ready to follow your plan. Or or you know, and so so it's not also just you know, is this a God idea or is this a, a my idea? It's also, you know, just paying attention to when, you know, it's, it's a new season. So one last question before I let you go. When describing the meaning of living your truth, complete this phrase, not eat these words. I want you to tell me what's your third word, all right? Mm-hmm. Self-awareness, purpose, and... Identity. That's a first. <laughs> I like that. I'm going to say it again because you said nobody said it today. You are amazing. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much for being so brave 
and so open and so willing to share your story. Thank you so much. Of course. Thank you for having me. This was awesome. <laughs>